Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's session on pioneering our understanding of the human brain. My name is Dr. Roshan Akashinyun, and I'm a computational scientist and a clinical scientist by training. My research interests address information processing and coding in neural circuits with translational applications to neuropsychiatric and neurological disorders. Today, I will be talking to you about deep brain stimulation, opportunities, and ethical dilemmas. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar by LabRoots. We'd like to extend our special thanks to the Brain Initiative Program Directors, in particular, Dr. James Nat, for their efforts in organizing this session. Before I begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting questions during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. I'll be responding to your questions by email following my presentation. My presentation is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now let's jump right in. Neurological disorders affect as many as 1 billion people worldwide. Nearly 45 million adults suffered from mental illness in 2016, which is about 18% of the U.S. population. That costs about $100 billion in lost productivity. Brain disorders are placing a staggering multifactorial burden on society worldwide. So we are really ethically compelled to carefully consider and address these issues. There are various treatment options that are being explored and developed continually, behavioral, pharmacological, and surgical. The surgical options come in when the uh, other options are no longer really viable for the patient. Typically, the surgical options have been ablation or lesion, which are irreversible. But now there's a new neurotechnology deep brain stimulation, or DBS, which can be applied to those patients who are medically refractory. Now, we've been hearing a lot about DBS in the news. It's been called brain hacking. It's been given um, very large um, growth in the global market. Um, there's these amazing surgeries that are being reported and that the demand is growing in the field of neurology. And then, we're talking about these like miraculous recoveries for patients who have Parkinson's. And since that was so effective, people started extending it to psychiatric indications like depression and OCD, autism, et cetera. And it's even been extended now past that to disorders like stroke. And now even the US space program is involved. So what is DBS? It's a revolutionary new therapy in which a subcutaneously implanted pulse generation generator <laughs> sends continuous high frequency stimulation to deep structures in the brain via chronically implanted electrodes. The uh, deep brain stimulation device has often been called a brain pacemaker. And it looks like this. It's made of a lead wire with electrodes. The lead wires are being pointed to by the blue arrows and the electrodes are circled in red. There's an extension wire to which they're connected, and that's connected to the implantable pulse generator, which then will deliver the electrical pulses that will um, go to the deep targets in the brain that are specific for whatever the disorder is. The goal of DBS is to rebalance or modulate the neural circuits sufficiently to shift the patient into their best functional state. The mechanism of action of DBS is suggested to provide therapeutic relief of refractory symptoms via the modulation of dysregulated networks. But in fact, we don't really understand the mechanisms or the principles of DBS yet, which actually matches our neurological disorders. We also don't really know how these disorders, what the dysfunction is that underlies these disorders. We have some ideas, but those also have not been fully determined yet. But we do think that they have to do with these um, central circuits that involve the cortex, the basal ganglia, and the thalamus. And this is a circuit that goes around in a loop. And what's really important is to keep a good balance between those pathways that are in that loop. 
So these pathways um, are signaling each other through uh, synchronized oscillatory activity at different frequencies. And it's really sensitive, the circuit, to those frequencies. And it's thought that a change in these oscillatory frequencies might be uh, responsible for the disruption, uh, for the change in the behavior that is reflecting a disruption in the synchronous activity. Now, um, DBS has been approved for uh, Parkinson's, uh, essential tremor, and dystonia. These were the original ones for which DBS was approved. And motor disorders and psychiatric disorders make up neuropsychiatric disorders, and the motor disorders were the first ones to be approved. And then it was extended to um, obsessive compulsive disorder in the psychiatric psychiatric disorders category. Um, and it's being used off-label, or has been used off-label, for Tourette syndrome, addiction, and also autism, and other disorders. So we're gonna to concentrate today on Tourette syndrome. What is Tourette syndrome? Gilles de la Tourette syndrome is classified by its symptoms. It is classified through childhood onset, multiple, the presence of multiple motor tics, and at least one phonic tic. And all of these have to be persistent for at least a year and in the absence of some other medical uh, issue or pharmaceutical um, involvement. So using DBS, we'd like to be able to take the opportunity to understand perhaps the pathophysiology underlying um, Tourette syndrome, and maybe see if there's a role for oscillations, and ultimately see if we might be able to find a biomarker that would help us therapeutically. So um, in our lab back in Florida, what we did was use um, this NeuroPace device, which has these electrodes now circled in red into a deep target. Um, and then we implanted this impulse generator in the cranium. The study design was for five subjects who were treatment refractory with Gilles de la Tourette syndrome. We did chronic recordings using the NeuroPace system. So these recordings occurred over time while the patient was implanted and moving around freely and behaving. Um, the implants were in the central median nucleus of the thalamus, and we recorded local field potentials. And we then used the clinical metric, the um, Yale Global Tick Severity Scale, or the YGTSS, to assess symptomatology. And what we found was that, there were, was that there were clinical benefits correlated with an increase in the gamma band power. So the oscillatory frequency that we found was relevant for Tourette syndrome, and we found one that was, was in fact gamma. And what we ended up finding was that there was a high post synchrony that was correlated with the um, pathophysiology. So on the left, you can see our five patients and um, the various frequencies that were recorded. And on the right, you can see those same five patients after six months, and you can see that um, the responders are the ones in the center who have this spike in the gamma frequency range. So an increase in gamma was correlated with a decrease in symptomatology as reflected on the YGTSS. And when we looked at the other frequencies, we did not see a correlation with symptomatology, which you, which you can also see here. So we found that there was an increase in thalamic gamma synchronization that correlated with a decrease in symptomatology. There was a clinical correlation between gamma oscillations and the symptomatology, as I said, and that other oscillatory frequencies did not directly correlate with clinical benefit. The findings derived from this research have um, offered important insights into tick genesis and tick expression, because up until then, we really didn't have any understanding of what was underlying tick genesis. And now we can correlate that with a hyposynchronization of gamma oscillations in the CM thalamus. And that impacts patient care and, of course, patient quality of life when we're able to effectively apply that in uh, deep brain stimulation therapy. So we could modulate the gamma band activity in long-term deep brain stimulation of the central median nucleus of the, of the thalamus and use that to mitigate the pathophysiology that's associated with Tourette syndrome. 
And that gamma band oscillations could in, in fact serve as a biomarker for Tourette syndrome and could be useful in um, online uh, neurosurgical procedure to help guide the neurosurgeon to um, the uh, optimized target location and as well in closed loop stimulation. Now, we want it, even though we have a lot of advantages and opportunities that we gain from using deep brain stimulation, we also have to consider um, the ethics. So there's two things to consider when we're doing ethical considerations. One is deep brain stimulation itself and what's associated with that. And the other is Gilles de So what do I mean by that? Well, with deep brain stimulation, of course, there's a risk of surgery and um, all the risks that are associated with having brain surgery, including hemorrhages, et cetera. Um, there can be, or epileptic seizures. Uh, we also have to consider that we do not understand the mechanism of actual brain stimulation. And while it's touted as being reversible, unlike our other um, um, ablation uh, therapy and lesion therapy, uh, what we don't really know is what, how much plasticity is involved um, when we do provide deep brain stimulation. And now it's been suggested that we do in fact see some plasticity. So that's also debated. So the reversibility of it is debated. Um, and of course, there are the side effects that come from uh, the specific target and um, the stimulation parameters that are applied. So we can have various side effects that come actually from the deep brain stimulation in the therapeutic stage itself. Now, for Gilles de la Tourette syndrome, we have to consider patient selection. Age is a very important um, topic here and also the clinical presentation. We wanna look at target selection because target selection is also a hotly debated um, issue in deep brain stimulation therapy, which extends across all the um, neurological disorders to which it's applied, Parkinson's, um, Tourette's, OCD, et cetera finding the optimal deep target in the brain and the optimal region of that target as well. Um, and each of those will give a specific outcome. And for Tourette syndrome, we also wanna look at the natural history, which I'll discuss with you in a minute. And we have to consider that Tourette's is rarely shown in its pure profile and often is found comorbid with other disorders, especially um, obsessive compulsive disorder and ADHD. So um, here we can see that um, in a study that has looked at uh, the baseline values in um, very large DBS cohorts that, that the um, onset, the age of onset um, for Tourette's was approximately 7.8 years, but the diagnosis occurred at 12.3 years, and then the surgery occurred at 2.8 at 29 years. And one of the things that is important to consider, as I mentioned, is the comorbidities. And the comorbidities for Tourette's are often what drive the patient to actually seek medical care. So it's the expression of the symptoms of those comorbidities that are really important and provide a complex profile for the patient. And that also affect what we see here as the various targets that are available um, for the application of DBS. So one of the most compelling ethical issues here is at what age do we perform DBS on a patient? As you saw, the average age was 29, even though the onset age was seven and the diagnosis was 12. Well, this is relevant when we look at the natural history of Tourette syndrome. Here on um, the x-axis, we look at the age of the patient and on the y-axis, we can see the relative tick severity. And if you look, you'll see that the tick severity is peaking just pre-pubertally. Now that's a very sensitive time, psychologically and physiologically for people, for children. These are sensitive periods in which a lot of changes are occurring. And so you really wanna ask yourself, do you wanna interfere at that point with a child's development? If you're gonna have a spontaneous resolution of the symptoms, do you really want to interfere with a child and do brain surgery? This is a very important question to ask. 
normally you would just jump to the conclusion and say, well, I, I shouldn't interfere because the, the, there's a very good chance that the symptoms were resolved spontaneously. But let me remind you that ticks can present themselves in various ways and including self-injurious behavior, which can be very damaging. But notwithstanding that, when you see someone who's barking and yelping and jumping up and down, you would imagine that they are mentally incompetent, which is not the case for Tourette's patients. In fact, they are completely competent and um, are would like to engage as much as possible in normal activity, but that becomes really confounded by the tics and also by these various comorbidities that can occur with um, uh, Gilles de la Tourette syndrome. And so, especially in severe cases um, where you have things like self-injurious behavior, you can really have a lot of consequences to these symptoms, including physical injury, emotional distress, you can have obstruction of education because the children have a hard time attending school, whether it's for concentration or because the other kids are giving them a hard time. And you also have the psychosocial impairment that goes with that. So you can do irreparable harm by the time you get to young adulthood because of all these other issues that occur. So why would you consider DBS for juveniles? Well, you would you want to emotional problems that can occur and prevent them. You certainly want to um, try to give the best chance for normal social development to the child. And of course, an academic development that is unimpeded. And these children, because of these issues, can develop low self-esteem and finally mood or anxiety disorders. And so these are very serious problems that absolutely affect their development. Well, why wouldn't you want to consider DBS for juveniles? Because you're implanting a device in a developing brain that, as we said earlier, we don't know exactly how it works and we're not sure of the plasticity issues, et cetera. We have limited knowledge of the long-term effects. These have not been studied well and certainly not in juveniles for, uh, who have gotten DBS. Uh, the devices are very quickly evolving. This is new neurotechnology and continually changing and so you want to be considerate of that um, as well. And there might be a competing desire for the implant. You don't know if the child really wants it or if they're competent to say they do. And what if by the time they're 18, they don't? Now you really have an issue about having, what, another brain surgery to remove the device and, you know, financial burden for doing it. There's a lot of issues that are then correlated with that. And finally, when we consider the natural history, as we said, well, there's a really good chance that there's going to be a spontaneous resolution. So do we want to interfere with the developing brain by doing brain surgery and all the risks that are associated with brain surgery for uh, the juvenile? So what's the bottom line? Well, we really need to sit and think about the risks versus the benefits. And these have to really be tailored to each individual patient and considered by a group. There has to be a team that is involved in. There has to be a team that's involved in the decision making, and it has to be very carefully considered. And it would be very beneficial to have a neuroethicist on that team to help guide the team through all these different issues that can come up and are really quite intricate. I'd like to thank the team in Florida that. Um, we did the work together uh, for the data that I showed you previously. And finally, I'd like to thank you very much for your attendance. And as a reminder, I'd like to let you know that if you have any questions about my presentation, then please go ahead and send them in and I will answer you by email. Stay tuned for our next track, Neuroethics, where we will hear from our top experts on the ethics of using new neurotechnologies and the impacts of our advancements to ensure these objectives continue with best practices. Hope to see you there.